Well, hi there. Welcome to Streets and Eats, the podcast where we want to inspire your next trip by telling you about some fantastic destinations and, of course, the best food to eat while you're there. Now, remember, the pandemic's still going strong, and so while we're waiting for the world to open back up, just listen to us and make some plans. In this episode, we're going to take you to one of our favorite countries in Europe, Italy. That's right. The land of pasta, cheese, and wine, and olive oil, and balsamic vinegar, tiramisu, pizza. Oh yeah, the list goes on and on. And of course you notice all he did was mention food. (laughs) Well, yeah, the food's pretty important. But there's, of course, amazing historical sites, beautiful architecture, the Renaissance. The Renaissance. 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 How does she say it? Renaissance. Renaissance. That sounds more French than Italian. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. The thing is, every European country has so much to offer, but Italy is a great one. There is no doubt. It is. It's hard to beat Italy. And of course, number one, well, first of all, we're going to give you our, our top five Italy. The problem is whittling it down to five is almost hard. impossible. We have been to Italy, well, more times than I can times. count. <laughs> the first time I went to Italy was with my father and my sister. And I was only How in, old were you? I was in ninth grade. And that we counts. went there on our own, just the three of us. You stayed and in a convent. We stayed in a convent and ate breakfast before. with. <laughs> with the bishop each morning. You can still stay in a convent it's a good today. Story, yeah. Um, and then all I did was was collect posters from all the different places we went. And my idea was I was gonna get back to the States and I was gonna pepper my room with all these posters like all American children do. And uh, my sister lost my posters in the taxi. What she left them behind or something? She did. Oh no. So all I had was my actual photographs that I took. But that's okay. They were great, too. Well, Rome is our first pick. Um, But now, I think it's important to say these top five places, we're not really presenting them in any type of order. No. And Rome is not my favorite place in Italy. Uh, Yeah, overall. The the reason that we've got to always include the capital city is because that's where all the money goes. That's where the governments make these huge um, museums that are just... I mean, you can't help but go to them. They're where all the wonderful. artifacts go. Exactly. So you visit all the sites, but then if you want to see what was in the sites or what was in the castles, you pretty much have to go to a museum in the capital city. Yeah. And I like I like the littler places better. But I have to say, Rome Rome is sweet. Rome is, it's a is pretty, romantic. Pretty good city. Rome has good food and lots of stairs. It's got Rome in history. And lots of Rome in history, which um, if you don't know this by now, you'll soon find out that Jim and I love Roman history. Yes. We search it out everywhere we go. Yeah. And I mean, it's been the capital, the capital of Italy and Rome for thousands of years. So it's got that history. So as far as capital cities go, I think it's one of the, the most stunning because of the history. Yeah, I mean, I like it. It's just it's a city, and I'm much more of a country girl, but that's okay. So, of course, the things you have to do in Rome. Well, you got to go to the Colosseum. The Colosseum, the Roman Forum. Yeah, I mean, as you're walking around there, you're going to deal with crowds, regardless of the day of the year. I mean, I think if you go on Christmas, you're going to hit crowds. So, don't even worry about it. (laughs) Yeah, don't even worry about it. Just go whenever you want to. Just go. I don't know if there's a low season, per se. One time we went in November. It was our Thanksgiving break, um, and it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. And in fact, we did get reservations into the Vatican. Yeah. And and the whole the Vatican's, we could probably do a whole podcast on that, just getting in and, sure. and trying to find the the Sistine Chapel. Which, right. You which, think it'd be easy. Okay. Here's the thing about the Sistine Chapel, folks. It is gorgeous. Is it worth going to? Yes. Oh, yes. Is it a pain in the... But to get there, uh, double yes. Well, it's hard to get tickets into the Vatican. You can go and you can wait in the long line that could you take can pay hours. A lot of money for a private tour. Um, although I think it, at this stage right now, it is open, <sighs> but you have to get your tickets online. You can't. You can't go stand in line right now. Yeah, but that's not the. That's not the problem. The problem is once you get in. Yeah, all the people. No, 
That's not the problem either. The problem is. Did you get lost in the Vatican? The problem is in the Vatican that you're following a path. And the path says Sistine Chapel with a little arrow. Sounds simple. You follow. You go to the next little sign. Sistine Chapel this way. Sistine Chapel this way. As you're going oh, through room after room after room of stunning art and gosh. ancient maps and all kinds of stuff in the collection that it's great to see. But you're going to get burned But by out. the time you get to the Sistine Chapel following that route, oh my God. Unless you have a lot more stamina than I do. And I think I have a pretty good travel stamina. You're going to get burnt out. Um, really, what you need to do is you go to the second floor. And you ask the guard, where's the quickest way to the Vatican? You have to go to the second floor because, the I mean, not the Vatican, the Sistine Chapel. You have to go to the second floor because the Sistine Chapel is kind of in between floors almost. Right. Maybe it's not really, but it seems like it is. And it's got like a secret way to get there. So that's what you want to find out. Because otherwise, unless you want to be in that Vatican Museum all day long, and some people are, then... You know, don't follow. Well, the and it's kind of tricky because, like I said, you're going through room after room of the of museum with amazing stuff to look at, and so you start out looking at all the stuff, and you don't realize that you're going to be going through an hour later, twenty or thirty of these rooms, and two if hours you later get to the Sistine Chapel before you're completely burned out. Yeah, you got to find the shortcut, which yeah. you can do. And um, the other thing you can and do, and it is worth it. It is worth it. And the other thing you can do is to get there ahead of the crowds is to book the breakfast at the Vatican, which is one of the ticket options that you can get uh, on their website. And you get in early, way before any crowds. And you get an Italian There's, breakfast. And you get, well, actually they call it an American breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> the breakfast is not really the reason you're doing no, it. No, it isn't. So go ahead and, you know, get some coffee. They, that's still pretty good. And a little bit of food. But really, you're getting there before the Vatican opens to the public so that you get kind of like a, a sneak peek, early entry type thing. And it's well worth the price. And you can sit at the Sistine Chapel a lot longer and watch it. Yeah. Can't take any pictures, but you no, can but I just, take a good look at I just it. love sitting on one of those side benches and just gazing up at that amazing ceiling. Michelangelo was at his best. Yeah, he was. So there's lots of other things to do. Of course, you've got to go to the Trevi Fountain and throw in a coin. You've got to walk up the Spanish Steps. You've got to go to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Go to the Pantheon. Yeah. And there's, you've got to eat. And you've got to eat. Yeah. And you've got to shop. Yeah. This. Well, I mean, we're not big shoppers, but... If you're into anything style, clothing, well, leather, handbags, leather goods, leather, anything like that, that's definitely the place to go. That's just, you know, whether you buy anything or not, walking down some of those streets are amazing. Yeah. Well, and when the shops are in renovated medieval or Renaissance buildings, just going into the shop to see the building itself is worth it to me sometimes. But there's so, 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 so much to do on a trip to Rome. Again, that's probably, we could do a whole podcast on just that. Or, I don't know, maybe convince you to just buy a book and do tours. Because it is, the thing with Rome is it's huge. Those seven hills are sprawling, let me tell you. Right. Um, we did, one of the things I really enjoyed the last time we went, Um was that we went on the on this bus. We took the bus to the beginning of the Appian Way. Now, the Appian Way is the road that the Roman soldiers used to take going in and out right. of the city, of the, of the capital city. It goes from Rome to Brindisi. And so you get off the bus and all of a sudden, you know, you're kind of on the outskirts of the city. Yeah, like you're in the countryside. And you're walking on these huge flat stones where you can see not tire treads. What do you call them? No. Ruts where Wagon the wheels wheel had ruts. gone. Yeah. And uh, it's just. And you're walking on a road that was built. 2000, 2000 years, years ago. ago almost. And it's in some places in better shape than roads <laughs> that were built 10 <laughs> years ago here. <laughs> uh, but it was really fun. And you can walk a good portion of it. I mean, you can probably walk 
lots of it if you really want to go hiking for days and days. But during the day, you can take a good day hike. Um, there's a couple of little stops along the way. It's very there's park-like. A, it's very park-like. There's a couple kiosk and vendors, a restaurant or two, but it's but it's spread out and it's peaceful and it's And quiet. there's a few sites that's where a lot of the catacombs are. And you can still see some aqueduct ruins. And you walk to one end of, well, a shorter end of the road. Not, I would say we walked about what a mile, maybe a mile and a half. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't that long. And that's enough. And then you can pick up. I'm not sure if it's the same bus or a different bus from that end and go back in, so you don't have to walk back and forth. It's on the very road. simple, though. It's very simple, and it's, I think it's well worth a little sort of foray to the outskirts of the city. Now, I mean, you can talk about the historical sites to see all day long because there's tons of them. Tons. I mean, hundreds and hundreds. Everything that you could imagine is there. And we didn't even mention any of the cathedrals and the churches. Um, There is one cool church. I forget the name of it, but I'll look it up um, where you look through the keyhole and you can see. Oh, yeah. The dome of the cathedral. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's like it's it was a hidden gem and now it's sort Until of like it everybody got knows put about on it. Instagram too many times yeah. and now you can go directly to the spot. Yeah. You know, with Google Maps it's like dropped a pin. Anyway, um so there's lots of cool things to do in Rome. But I think really one of the main reasons that you want to go to Rome is just for the feel of it. Just for walking around in the in the humidity and the heat of the autumn or not autumn, but summer nights, or the crisp autumn nights, or anything at night, because at night it's so much prettier. The lights just make everything prettier, like San Angelo's Castle along the river. Mm. That's something that I always picture when I think of Rome. Right. And you can just walk around all these beautiful places. Plus then, you know, you've got to stop in for for dinner, whether you're going for a a full-on primera party and a secundi party, or you're going for pizza. pizza. There's so much to try. Although I got to tell you, one of my favorite things is more of a morning kind of thing. Um, bakery. The bakery and the, and the coffees. Yeah, because oh, they yeah. have the most delectable pastries that are like flaky crusts with stuffed with this amazing cream. And yes, and the coffee is always good in Italy. I don't yeah. think I've had a bad coffee anywhere. Well, and it's hard. It's hard to order coffees. I mean, you just go in there and say everything you want, and they're going to give you what they what they think you want anyway. I we've gone in <laughs> so where we times. get the, the little espresso one cup thing to try and fancier ways of ordering, and I'm not sure we've ever been overly successful because we really don't know what we're doing. But we do get good coffee and you can never go can... wrong ordering a cappuccino, even though it's not really a breakfast coffee, they'll still make it for you. And one thing you got to remember about the cafes there is they're usually for standing. Like we were we were in northern Italy in a place that we're going to mention pretty soon. But the cafe there was like kind of at this little bus stop type area where we were meeting up with our tour group. And we went into the cafe and it's a standing cafe, which most of them are, although this place had plenty of room. So it wasn't a room issue in this particular place. Um, but it was amazing watching. And this is the kind of thing that I love. It was amazing watching the different people that came in and they were coming in as regulars. They come in. The bartender or cafe barista would either know what they wanted or quickly make what they wanted. They would sit there and chat for a good, you know, five or 10 minutes, down their coffee and out the door they went. This was, they weren't there to spend a whole lot of time, but they got a little socializing in. Mm -hmm. They might have grabbed a pastry to go and they got their shot of coffee. And it was just so fun watching that. And that was breakfast. That's all breakfast usually is. Right. It's a typical Italian breakfast. You spend more time at lunch or dinner. Yeah. And you're going to find good food everywhere. And I think we found this uh, one restaurant, the Felice Attestazio, that was incredible. But why did we go there? We went there because we always look up what is what that place so what is rome known for right and in in italy you might not know this but in italy different parts of the country are known for different pastas 
And I, I guess I didn't really know that. Or I did know it maybe, but it didn't really, didn't really know drive that itself it make, home. Yeah. Until we went to Rome on this particular trip. And um, we were looking for this particular pasta, which is called... Caccio e Pepe. Caccio e Pepe. It sounds so Italian, doesn't it? And you can find it all over Rome because it's a very Roman meal or Roman dish. But you really want to find the best, right? So that's how we found this Felice Adestaccio. It is known for its caccio e pepe. And it was not easy Cheese to find. And peppers, it was what that not means. easy to find. No, it wasn't. We had a car because we always, we didn't have a car? We didn't have a car on that trip. Okay, so scratch that part. And in fact, it was our. It wasn't easy to find. It, it wasn't easy to find at all. But. Um, of course, it's on Google Maps nowadays, and you can find anything on Google Maps. And we'll put a pin on on our map so you can see exactly where it is. Everything in Rome is pretty easily accessible by public transport, um, so you're going to be able to get there. But what we really loved about this place, yes, the cacio e pepe was, was delicious. It's amazing. It's probably the simplest pasta that you're going to get. Cheese, pepper. Fresh pasta. There's really not a whole lot more to it. It doesn't seem like it's... doesn't sound good. It, it, yeah, it doesn't seem like it would be as tasty as it is, but it's delicious. But they bring it out and they they prepare it at the table. They mix it all up Which for you right at the table. Nice. So everything is mixed like hot and fresh. And it's incredible. And they also do a carciofo a la Roman, Romana, right? Which is an artichoke. It's like braised artichoke. Which is also known for... That's delicious. But really what I liked about this restaurant was the feel of it. You get in, it's exposed to brick on the inside. Um, it's not like a fine dining place, but it is still, it feels upscale. And it is just bustling. No matter when you're there, it's always bustling. And it's families over at this large group of tables over here, another family over here, a couple who are out on a date. It's not really, I'm sure there are tourists there, but it's not a tourist restaurant. It's a Rome restaurant. It's for the locals. And it's incredible. And that's why it was so hard to find. <laughs> maybe they, they do it that way intentionally. <laughs> they didn't think we could make it, but we persevered. Um, anyway, we'll put that link on the map, like you said. But even if you don't go to that, um, restaurant. When you're in Rome, you definitely need to try the artichokes and you definitely need to try the cacio e pepe. And you also need to try, and this is probably true all over, well, yeah, not just in Rome, but all over the country, um, the great pastries at the, right. at the cafes. So the coffee those the are three things we can definitely say you need to try. And we I mean, we didn't even talk about pizza. I mean, you know to go and have pizza. Yes. That's, that's a given. Yeah. So. And what I found in Italy is that the Italians are very good at leaving reviews on Google Maps. So if you don't want to go across town to find the best Cacio Pepe, you can do a quick search on Google Maps for Cacio Pepe and find one that's near you that has good reviews, and it's probably going to be really good. Anyway, go to Rome. The way I like to do capital cities, you're going to hear this again and again, is I go to the capital city for a few days, either on one end or the other of the trip. Um, just depends on flights and costs and things like that. Um, if I'm only going to that, if I'm only going to that place once, if I'm only going to Italy once, then I'm going to go to the capital city because, like we said, that's where the museums and and all the money's put into. But I'm not going to spend my whole time there because. A, I'm not a city person, but B, you don't, I don't feel that you really get a, a you know, get to talk to the a locals. true sense of the country. Yeah. I mean, Italians are great for talking to you. The, the waiters will talk to you. The people at your hotel will talk to you. Uh, people on the street might even talk to you. I mean, they're very friendly. Don't get me wrong. But it's a big city. But and it's, it's the same city. thing in big cities all around the world. People have a big city life that they're living and it just moves faster. There's less time for slowing down, although the Italians are very good at slowing down and they know how to relax. Mm. Okay, so we're going to move on. So the next places that we're talking about, uh, the next place 
is Albero Bello. And Albero Bello is known for its famous beehive houses, which are called Truly. Truly, truly that. they're called Truly. Truly, truly, that's what they're called, Truly. <laughs> Uh, they're whitewashed stone and they're cone shaped. They're built out of stone all the way from, from the, the foundation. foundation up to the peak of the roof and a carved, usually a carved stone pinnacle at the very tip. Of the and roof. these are probably like a day trip out of Naples. We did it over a weekend and we combined it with Matera, which you can do both Albero Bello and Matera easily in one weekend. And Matera isn't quite the same thing. It has, right. it, it's more of a cliffside city and it has almost like a underground field because they're like. All the passageways and yeah steps and alleys. Yeah, it's a very cool place. Both of them are world heritage sites. But today we just wanted to talk about Albero Bello because I think we had a little bit better experience in Albero Bello than we did in Matera. I mean, now. These are both great experiences. We're only talking degrees of separation here. But it's all about the people and the food for us. Yeah. And Albero Bello had it all going on. And it's but, a really romantic place just to go spend the night in one of these, you know, ancient stone buildings, stone houses, and be able to walk around the town after all the tours are gone and the streets are a little bit emptier and there's just locals walking around. That's always that's always a great way to do anything interesting like that. But what I love is 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 even the, just the story right. of how it came to be. I mean, it's very Italian. It's it well, it, it's very kind of medieval, kind of you know, surfish, and like back before the plague type of thing. Right. <laughs> well, the legend has it. Do you want me to tell it? Yeah, you tell the legend. All right. I love telling legends. Legend has it, back in the 16th century, when Italy was still under the control of the Spanish kings, uh, a, a certain count, his name's not important to us for, this, for anyway. purposes of our story, a certain count was given a fiefdom, a, an area of Italy near the Adriatic coast. And in order to build up his area and to attract more serfs, more peasants to his land, he promised them certain privileges. They could go into the forest. They could hunt. Uh, he would make trade easier for them with other villages. And so they came. But here was the problem. The Spanish king did not allow any permanent structures. So they weren't allowed to build any permanent structures. So the count came up with this idea that they could build uh, any buildings they needed to, provided they could be easily demolished. And so that's how they came up with the Truly, by stacking these flat stones, uh, one on top of another in a circular pattern, all the way up to a cone-shaped roof. And they actually had to knock them down a couple of times when the king came so that he wouldn't see any permanent buildings and tax the count. So it really came down to tax evasion. And I think they still practice and that today. you still see that today, <laughs> which I, was, is really why I love this story, is as you drive around Italy, and of course, the more southern you go, the more likely you are to see this, um, you'll see buildings that, are, that seem unfinished. They'll have maybe an, an addition built on onto the second floor but there'll be a window missing here or a door missing here. Or it won't have been completely finished on the outside and you'll still see the insulation. Or, I mean, just something it, small. Something in the house has to be, leave unfinished because you don't have to pay taxes on the unfinished part. On unfinished parts. So it's the it, it's gone down through the ages. They still like that. Anyway, what happened to us though is as we usually do. We're checking into one of these Trulos, Trulis, or Trulo, Truli, um, to spend the night. We were with my sister, and um, we had a really cute one. It was whitewashed mm. and had beautiful blue and white like a tiles. Row house with a few of them oh, connected. It was so pretty. Like Jim said, very romantic. Um, but we're talking to the guy who um, was giving us the room, and we had to talk over. 
the wedding bells because there was a church like half a block away and the bells just kept ringing and ringing and ringing come to find out it was huge wedding in the town and the whole town pretty much was going off to the feast to for these people who are getting married and he goes which is good for you and i said why he goes because you will want to go to lunch at the place that you would never be able to go to lunch if it weren't for the wedding mm, right because everybody goes there on sunday afternoons because sunday afternoon just like here is kind of a family time when they all the families get together go for and, a big meal yeah so he told wine. us exactly what to do we were on a hill and the restaurant was on a hill and in between us was Sort of a valley. You had to go down a big hill, Through down the to the center of town, and then up the other hill. And it was called Ristorante Trullo d'Oro, which is the truly of, of the truly the house of gold. of gold. And we're like, well, okay, well, we're going there because we, we never, have? never, never don't follow advice. Well, especially when they're so emphatic about it. Yeah. And we didn't even ask him for a change. Right. Right. So he said, well, you have to have the antipasto. And we're thinking, we're like, oh, okay. Antipasto? Sure, okay. we'll have antipasto. He says, no, no, no. You have to have the antipasto of the house. And on the menu, it's called antipasto del trullo d'oro. And I remember this. He says, it costs 18 euros. And Jim and I both were kind of like, what? what? 18 Each? euros for antipasto? Yeah, but he says, but don't worry. You will not Leave go hungry. away hungry. And if you do, you can just order something else off the menu. No, but you're not going to. I don't, we won't. we turned things away. Yeah, we had to. It was plate after plate after plate of house specialties, regional specialties, Italian specialties, a plate of of salamis and meat, and salamis and cheese and melon and the fritti, the fried stuffs, and just vegetables and oh my gosh. I can't even tell you everything we ate that day. I Fish, think we were there for like two oysters, hours. Clam, at least two hours of solid, just nibbling away at these small plates. As they just brought plate after, plate after plate after plate after plate. It was amazing. It was probably one of the best meals of my life. Yeah. It, it's memorable for sure. I wish we had taken notes or <laughs> like have him explain each dish. But he, the waiter didn't speak a whole lot of English. Of course, our Italian. Mm -hmm -hmm. And we hadn't seen my sister, so we were sitting chatting with her yeah, the whole time. Right. It was so, more of a visit for us. Yeah. But anyway, it was it was an amazing meal. Like he said, like Jim said, one of the best of our lives. And one that we would clearly go to again and again if uh, we had the chance. But it's also just a great countryside to drive around because you can see these trulies that were built as farmhouses or as an inn in the countryside. Or as barns. I mean, everything. Barns, yeah. And it's, they're just so pretty. They're so picturesque. They're some are falling incredible. down. Some are in good shape. It's just, it's Italy. It's gorgeous. Um, The next one. Where should we, we go next? I think the next one should be Parma. Parma. Mm. Now, you talk about food. You can't not talk about Parma and the Emilia Romagna region. And which the capital of that is, is uh, Bologna. And we've been to Bologna a few times. And it's just, and then right up the road is an amazing city called Ravenna, which is gorgeous as well. But, you know, you can only do so much on a trip to Italy. So we, we're trying not to overwhelm you, but really there's a lot of cool places to go. But if you're a foodie, if, if you like, if you are like us and, and really you'll just travel for food. You, you want, want to see to the processes where, where it's made, visit the the farms if you can, where the produce comes from. That's what we love to do. Any type of food factory or things like that. That's, uh, I mean, that's our tourism as far as, as far as we can get it. So we plan on going to Parma. Parma is... You might recognize the noun, um, the name of the town. It it's shows up everywhere. Famous for Parma Parmesan. ham. And it's also famous for Parmesan cheese. Parmigiano. How do you say it? Parmigiano. Reggiano. Parmigiano. Reggiano. <laughs> I'm not the best Italian. <laughs> but anyway, so what we did was um, we knew we wanted to go here. On our trip, and this was kind of our last one of our last little things we did as we were leaving 
uh, Europe before we moved to Japan the last time. So it was a couple of years ago. And we'd known lots of people who had done this, we, who had done this tour and it's an all day tour. And it was all about, yeah, like Jim said, the processes and getting to know the ingredients really, really well. So our first stop, which was my favorite stop. The Consorzio Produ- Produttori Latte, which is like the consortium of the production of milk. And in this case, cheese. And in this case, cheese. It started out <laughs> as uh, a way of supplying milk to the city and the region where all of the dairy farmers had one central location where they could bring their milk. Well, it quickly became the place where they make cheese. So it's still all of the region's milk is collected in uh, only a couple of, of small factories. And that's where they make all the Parmigiana. And in fact, it's so small. We pulled up to this building and it looked just like a, a brick building that was not overly large, maybe almost the size of the front of a um, strip mall yeah, with a little blue door and some windows and a little entry to a shop. So you're looking at the outside of this thing and you're going, I'm okay, make cheese here and I want to be, be here. Are you yeah. sure? So we go in and well, as soon as you walk in the shop, it's just amazing. Just the amazing smells of the cheese. And they also sell, you know, other like local specialty items, salamis and ham, of course. But the cheese is what it's all about. And you have to go on a tour. You can't just go visit the factory part. And that's true. That's why we did this as a tour for the whole day, because that was that's true for the Parma ham and that was true for the um balsamic vinegar and all right. of that. I mean you can go to the stores there, but you can't really go inside but the You factories. can't go inside without making some sort of arrangements for a tour. You can't just show up. So our cheese tour took us from start to finish, collecting the milk, putting the milk in the brine, turning the big rolls of um cheese, cutting them, putting it up for um fermentation. La 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 la. And I actually mean, we got there everything. a little bit late in the morning. To see the cheese process, but we did still manage to see them finish off the last two, like two big, huge copper vats where they were, where the process was just starting with the curds and, and pulling it all up in the cheesecloth. So that was really cool. And we were also, I think, super lucky because we were there on the day when the regional inspector was checking their cheeses to make sure that they're you know meeting all the quality requirements to actually be labeled as a Parmigiano or Reggiano cheese. And if it passed, they had a a big iron brand that gets heated up and they brand the wheel of cheese with the acceptance stamp. It's so cool. Yeah. So this guy is up on this ladder that looks like a crane because it's an automated ladder and he's got his blowtorch and he's got his stamp and he's got a little piece of paper a and pick, I, then, think, he like... I mean he had all his tools up there and he was meticulously going to each wheel of huge um wheel of cheese and branding it that it had past inspection and they and are huge the date i mean these things are like 75 pounds what about two feet across three feet across I don't know, but maybe big. 10 inches tall. Huge. Huge. And then we saw them cut into one, which was amazing. Mm. And then we got to try it. And then we got to try it. And, you know, my experience with Parmesan cheese, <laughs> of course, is way it's before. It's like shaker cheese, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Way before, you know, Parmigiano. That was never on my radar. I always thought it was shaker cheese. Yeah. It came grated. You bought it in a green can and you didn't have to be refrigerated. You just shake it out on your spaghetti sauce. Anyway, this is not that. This is not that. This is one of the most incredible cheeses in the world. And I'm sure you've you've seen it maybe at a market or at an Italian restaurant. But to see wheels and wheels and wheels of it at uh, different oh, yeah. levels of how many months it's been fermenting and how long it is and how much it costs, that's that's a pretty impressive sight. But Jim did find out that mm-hmm. if you want to get your own wheel. You can buy it. You can buy it from Costco, of course. Of this course, is like Costco. the ultimate bulk food item. 
only a thousand bucks for your own wheel. Uh, I believe the Costco wheels that they sell are the 24 month variety. So you don't get all the choices of 12, um, the factory store where we were, and we got to have tastings of were like one years, two years, three years. I think one of them was 10 years. It was amazing. Um, so anyway, we enjoyed the cheese. We like cheese. We really enjoyed the cheese factory. Um, then we moved on to the ham factory, which I thought was just as interesting. I did too. Well, in some ways, I mean, they're just completely different. So in some ways it was more interesting, but again, as soon as you walk in, Oh, you can it's smell like, oh my, that, oh. the aroma of, you know, decades of curing prosciutto. Mm. So good. It's incredible. Uh, and that's another place where you can go to the factory store and you can buy a prosciutto there, but you can't just walk up and take a tour. You have to be with a guide. You have to be on a tour that's already set up. Uh, and they take you through the whole process from the basement up to the different floors where they're salting the hams, they're curing the hams, they're seasoning the hams. I think the whole process takes three years. And it's a very, again, exacting thing. They have to follow very strict guidelines to be able to get the, the what do you call that? The DOCG. Stamp of approval, yeah. Yeah, the regional approval. And they had just gone through a scandal. Mm -hmm. earlier and so they told us a little bit about it how um some vendors were trying to to skirt the system and instead of getting the true 100 percent italian um pigs that they were buying pigs from well they're smuggling in the semen yeah from denmark was it denmark or yeah Norway? it was denmark oh because the pigs in denmark apparently are leaner so less fat which means more meat, which means they can get more That's right. meat produced per pig, which means more money, of course. But once you start messing with the fat content, now you've got a different product. Uh, yeah, it was a big scandal. It was a big scandal. and They were still reeling from it. You could tell. They talked about it with us for a good 30 minutes. And it was a huge investigation. Lots of people got fired. I think even the mayor was involved. I mean, it was it was a big thing. Um so I think you can be assured now, though, that they're 100% yeah. Italian because a few more they cracked down on them. But one of the coolest things I learned while I was at the Parma ham factory was how the people working there would inspect the meat to make sure that it was still good. Oh, yeah. With the horse bone pick. They use a horse bone pick. It's still like today. A, it's like about a, what, six inch long skewer. With a very sharp, pointy end. And we got to hold it, and we actually got to, to put it. one in. And, yeah, smell it. That's what they do, is they put it into the ham, and then they pull it back out. And then, of course, little bits stick to the shards on the bone that, I mean, they can't really see it as much. It's more... It's more of the smell. The smell. And the feel. And, the, and you smell it, and you can... Oh, Because so the horse bone apparently has no smell of its own, but it holds perfectly the smell of whatever it comes into contact with. So, and that's how they check whether it's, whether the ham is ready or if it's the right quality. Uh, I don't know, but it art. was very cool. Um, then we went and found, uh, well, we didn't find it because it was on this tour, but we <laughs> went to a balsamico vinegar um, place in Reggio Emilia. And it was called the Tenuda La Rampada Estate. When, while we were there, I mean, the, daughter who i guess this estate had been in their family for well generations they're medicis yeah that's right they were they were um they they're went all the way back from to the, the medicis Medici families which we, is an incredible story in and of its own that's right but then to see the process that they use to make this balsamic vinegar is incredible and again this is one of those things growing up i yeah i'd had balsamic vinegar it's the stuff you splash on with olive oil it's a very light, tangy, kind of the purplish color. That's not really what we're talking about here. No. This is more of a syrup. It's like a syrup. And it's also aged in barrels, in wooden barrels. And you have, it's so reduced. I forget the exact amount, but 
it takes an amazing years. amount of grapes to make yeah. uh, the balsamic wine, the balsamic vinegar, much more than it would to make wine. So that's why most Italians are making wine and not vinegar. And that's why the true balsamic vinegar can be so expensive. It's pretty much like gold. It's worth its weight in gold. Yeah. So they take you up into the attic where they're making it. And again, you're hit with that, that heady aroma. Uh, very kind of sweet and just really luscious smell, I think, with the wood from the casks and the evaporating vinegar, because that's how they do it. They fill up a large cask with the first set of vinegar, and it evaporates because eva they leave the top of it open, covered with a little uh, cloth so that the flies, bugs can't get in. And then they let it evaporate and evaporate after a certain amount of time. They transfer it to a different cask, a smaller cask, again, with the top open. And they just keep going into smaller and smaller casks until it's ready. And the, they use different wood types for the cask. So they have cherry and oak. and. Uh, so in the Medici family, every time a baby was born, they would be given a barrel. And that barrel they started putting in the grapes that year, the year that they were born and it had their name on it. And that was their barrel that would eventually become their vinegar. Right. It was such a cool tradition. They're coming of age. So they could, you could see, and what happens is they start out in a big barrel and then the barrels get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so the smallest barrels have the most uh, reduced, I guess. Yeah. Want, uh, vinegar. I want to keep saying wine because that's what you do when you reduce wine, but it, it's such a similar process, but it's for balsamic vinegar. And this stuff, they'll let you taste it on a specific spoon. Ceramic. Or porcelain, uh, ceramic. Porcelain. Or, yeah, not metal. And you get that spoonful and that's that's it. That's little, all you're getting. Like maybe two or three drops. Max. Yeah. And if you buy it, you kind of do that with yours too, because you don't want to waste it on a salad like we would put no. in normal. You want to put it on, as the guy told us, have it with some ice, it on cream. Your ice cream. Or just, you know, I just go in there and I see my bottle, he says, and and you can tell he was in love with this stuff. And he says, I just get my spoon out and I just have a taste. A special treat. And it just brightens my day. Yeah. And we're like, yeah. So did we buy and a it bottle? It does brighten your yes, day. Yes, we did. Oh, yes, we did. Yeah. A, a drop or two here and there. Uh, alongside your tomato and mozzarella salad, but even, or just a drop or two on the spoon. I think we've only had it on the spoon because <laughs> we don't want to waste it with other foods. And All right, taste. let's move on. Yeah. Anyway, anyway go to Parma. Parma. Oh, no, no, no. What we wanted to tell you is there is more to Parma than than just food. I mean, it's the most important reason to of go. Of course. But you can also go, and there's lots of beautiful architecture. The cathedral has got beautiful frescoes in it. The pink marble um, baptistry in the cathedral is amazing. They have a great Galleria Nazionale. And all that food, all that cheese, and and prosciutto and balsamico can all be had in the restaurants and the cafes anywhere in the region. But Parma is a great place to set up as your base of operations. Okay. All right. But we, but we will move, Let's on. move on. So the next place you've maybe heard of this place, it's called Cinque Terre and Cinque Terre mean the five lands, five lands. And so we were talking about going there and it's a drive over. It was a drive over the mountains for us because we were living in Eastern in um, Germany at the time. Germany, and so we could do it pretty much in a weekend, a long weekend. And so we were talking about doing this. And a friend of mine, who was a teacher at the same school I was at, said to me, "You're going to Cinque Terre. Do you know how to get there?" And I said, "Well, I mean, I have we Google have maps." maps. <laughs> and she how says, hard can it be? "And she goes, oh yeah, but me and my husband, we went one year." And we couldn't, we couldn't find we it. We tried. We couldn't find it. And I'm looking at her like, are you, like, are you, is this a joke? No. No. Well, it's, you can't it really. It isn't the easiest thing to You can't to really drive to the five towns of the Cinque Terre. So what we did instead was we drove to a town that was to the north. It's like the next town up. Bonasola. Bonasola. And from there, you can park. We stayed at a really nice pensione. 
that was steps away from the train station. And the beach. And the beach. Because the train station and was on the beach. Fabulous <laughs> little Italian restaurants. Um, really, it should be, how do you say, six in Italian? Six. It should be the, the six lands because no. Buona Sola is well, they're, a they're nice place pretty. all on its own. Yeah, they're all pretty down there. But it's not actually one of the Cinque Terre, but you can drive to it. And from there, you take the train. It's like a 10 minute train ride uh, into Vernazza, which is the second of the Cinque Terres heading south. Um, and I think one of the nicest ones. Do you? Yeah, I really like its harbor. The harbor is beautiful. And it's the, the one that's iconic. And the colorful buildings going up the cliffs on the sides. But Tigua Terra is not on the map. That's true. No. So you have to know what the five towns are. And the five towns are Monte Rosa del Mare, Venazza, Corniglia, Manarola, and Rio Maggiore. And Good a job. couple of them you can drive to and park the car. No, but out, right outside of the town and um, walk in. Or I think the better way to do it is to take the train. Or there's also a water taxi from La Spezia and from around that area, which we found out was a great way to take pictures um, of, the towns. of the towns from the waters. From the waters. They're beautiful. So, so we did that just for S and Gs so that we could go and. It's a little bit more expensive way to get around. But you're not going to get those views of the towns without being on the water. So that's yeah. a great way to do it. So we went to Cinque Terre in October. And we... Hoping that it would be kind of a shoulder season. Yeah. And it maybe it was. A sh I'm sure it was shoulder season. But it, was, and it wasn't as bad as it would be in the middle of summer. But there are still tons of people there. Crowded. What they've crowded. done nowadays is they've, they're starting to limit. So they will only sell, sell so many tickets for people to come into the towns. Um, but if you've watched the movie, what was that movie? Luca. Luca. Luca supposedly took place in the Cinque Terre yeah. in Vernazza, I think. It's a fictional town, but it's, I think it's definitely patterned after Vernazza. Yeah. And with all the um, red and yellow buildings and the hills. I mean, it is very hilly. Very because steep. It's on the hillside. And then you can walk from town to town to town to town to town. Unless, like when we were there, one of them was washed out for whatever yeah, reason. And they're still doing reopened yet. renovations. Because these are cliffside and, and hillside trails. If something like that happens, there may not be a way to fix it. But you still have plenty of places to hike. We hiked from Verazza to Monterosa de Mare. But I would go the other way. I would recommend you go from Monterosa down into Vernazza. They're the same views, but as you're hiking out of Vernazza, we tended to stop a lot and turn around and look back for the views. Whereas as you're hiking into Monterosso, yeah, it's a beautiful, a beautiful town. It's got a gorgeous beach, but it's not as beautiful as Vernazza. So if you were going the other direction, you'd be walking down the hill into Vernazza with the views in front of you the whole time. Where well, Jim is right, except for one thing. I am not a beauty hiker. So it's hard enough for me to keep my hair straight or whatever but it, once i've been sweating uh, so you want the pictures of vernats in the background before before i start you start sweating falling apart and yeah <laughs> thank you very much click click if i'm putting this on the gram i need to look at least halfway decent <laughs> because right. once you do those 600 steps and by and by that i mean that's only when you get to the staircase that's going the down into the, the, yeah. to the town that's not the hike itself um you're gonna you're gonna sweat so yeah, so that's so, what you do there. You're gonna hike. You hike between you eat, the towns. You sit on the beach. You, you look at the sunsets. Drink the wine. Eat fresh, fresh seafood. Definitely have to have the uh, Genoese pesto from the region. It's very unique. The area is called Liguria, and they have Ligurian pesto, which is supposedly the best in the in the entire country. And I I never was a pesto fan to be honest right me neither and I, we went to this i one never little, saw the allure 
<laughs> we went we were in Bonasola where we were staying. And as we mentioned, there was one little restaurant right on the beach. And it was just easy because we had already had on one of the days, we'd already been out, you know, pounding the pavement, riding the train, doing this, going into the churches, up and down hills, all over cobblestones. We were a little tired. And in Bonasola, it was very clearly the shoulder season. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was hardly anybody there. There was nobody there because there was only six people on the beach. It's not one of the Cinque Terre towns. Yeah. So we went to dinner there and we were at first we were the only pair there. Now, I'll never forget this place for two reasons. One was the wine and two was the the pesto. Now, let me tell you about the wine. You know how you go into a restaurant and you order a bottle of wine and the guy, the waiter brings it to you and they with a flourish, they uncork Uncork it it. and they pour you a little splash and they look at you with this smile like you know you're gonna love it i have never except for this one time took a swig that was rotten wine it It was was horrible it was so disgusting and so i i mean it was very obvious when i took it that it was bad and so the the waiter for at first didn't believe it he was like there's no way There's this American knows what she's doing. But then he smells the so cork. So he takes it, he sn- sniffs the cork, he sniffs the wine, he takes it back, and I'm sure he tasted it. And he comes back, you are right. Let me get you a good wine. So he gets me a different wine, and it, it was, was good. It was delicious. It was delicious. But I mean, it I'm sure happen. he was so embarrassed. Right. But it does happen. I was surprised. I didn't. That was something I didn't think would ever happen. So bucket list uh, tick. That's why you taste the wine. <laughs> but anyway, but then after that, um, they were even more gracious to us, yeah. which, which is hard to say. And he asked, you know, what do you, what do you want to eat? And I had seen that their specialty was the pesto. And here I am like really grappling with it because it's just not. So he gave us the whole story about Ligurian pesto and how the basil has to be grown in a special area and the sea, the sea air makes it, gives it this amazing flavor. And he goes, really, it is, it is the best dish. It is what I eat. Well, that, 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 that sealed the deal. It. We tried it. And not mm-hmm. only did we try it that time, but we went back again and had it again because it was, it was that so good. good. It was delicious. So definitely try the pesto. Yeah, so Cinque Terre, okay. all the towns are beautiful. They're all different from each other, um, but they're all beautiful and they're all well worth going to. And you can do all five towns easily in, I would say, three three or four, three days. Or four days. And we did quite a bit of hiking, like I said. So we did, we did it all. And you don't have to drive to it, of course. You can take the train from anywhere in Italy and you can get there. Yeah, you would go to La Spezia and go from there. All right, so we'll move on. So we're going to my absolute. Oh, this is a long one. Favorite place in Italy, and I would think you may have heard of it, but Most probably people haven't not. Heard of it. Most people, this is not even on their radar at all. This town is called Bolzano, and Bolzano is up in the Dolomites on the. In the Alto Adige region. And it's right on the border of Austria. And the Brenner Pass is right there. And, you're- and that's kind of how we found out about it. You would think as teachers, especially for other reasons, we'd have known about this town. But we didn't. Uh, instead, like the trip to Cinque Terre, we would drive from Germany through Austria, through the Brenner Pass, down into the Alto Adige. Adige. And pass all these amazing Beautiful mountain towns. towns that you can see from the autostrada. But we were going somewhere else. So you just kept on driving thinking, okay, someday we're going to come back and explore this region of Italy because it is stunning. Just stunning. And we didn't, we didn't even know how stunning it was. So we, we did. We planned it. And we said, okay, well, here's this town called Bolzano that looks like the center of the region, which it is. And a great place for your your base of operations for exploring the area. So that's where we went. And it was gorgeous. The town itself is gorgeous. And it, yeah, it quickly became one of our favorite towns in all of Italy. Um, it's a mountain town. It's in the Dolomites. And the vistas of the Dolomites are, are just vistas you, you just don't expect. 
the Dolomites are so jagged and high craggy and, and craggy. And and then when you're down just a little bit lower, they're so green. Stunning green And pastures there's so many beautiful and animals. And then there's like Swiss chalet type and the air mountain is huts. Always either crystal clear bluebird skies or the perfect fluffy cloud. They're just incredible. Just incredible beautiful. Skies. I mean, the, the, I can't even tell you how beautiful this area is. Um, so what we did was we based ourselves in Bolzano and then we did a few uh, road trips out into the mountains and to see things that were around. Um, inside the city, there's tons to do. And I, I think one of my favorite museums anywhere in the world in the world is in this town. I, I love a good mystery, don't you? I mean, I love mysteries on TV and books like my whole life. You know, I grew up Nancy Drew. What can I say? I love mysteries. So this museum, which is called the innocuous, very boring sounding South, South Tyrol, Tyrol Museum, Museum of Archaeology, Archaeology. <laughs> doesn't sound like much, but boy, is it cool. Yeah. You want to tell them about Utsi? Well, when, when I think of archaeology, I think of, as a friend of ours once put it, piles rocks. of rocks. For piles of rocks. <laughs> Which I love a good pile of rocks, so I'd still be in anyway. But that's not what this is all about. At all. This one is all about the Iceman. A murder mystery. Which I had heard of, and I think if you read National Geographic, Geographic, you've heard of it. Um, if you were around in the in the late ninety mid to late nineties, you've heard of it. The Iceman was a Neanderthal that was, was out hunting. found by a couple who were hiking through the Alps in a, a, a recessed glacier area, and he had been preserved in the ice. And yeah, he was discovered in nineteen ninety one, and when they did carbon dating and whatever other types of dating tests on him it came out that he was over five thousand years old but then once they got to looking at him they of course wanted to, they could still see the furs on his back everything is still in this he museum. had his pack with him he had his pack he had his arrows his arrows and his bow um and they realized that he had been killed by an arrow murdered. he had been murdered so this whole museum is solving the murder of the ice man or Maybe not solving it completely, but giving you a pretty good idea of what probably happened. And you wander through this museum, reading the the ice mummy's name is Utsi, reading his story. And there's even a little film mm -hmm. and um, there's hands on activities. And one of the coolest parts of all is the ice. um what do you want? To, like, it's not an incubator because it's the opposite of an incubator, but it's the ice room. That you can actually see him. See the body. It is so cool. I, honestly, I don't think I've ever been to a museum that has kept me so into the story as much as this one. Throughout the whole, what, two hours that you're there. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. But I, I love it because it has all those artifacts that they found in his pack. But more, what I enjoyed more was the story about how they, how they were able to you know, open the pack and preserve everything and do different testing on it to see what it was, how it was constructed, what he would have used it for. Uh, it's just incredible. Incroyable. We loved it. Um, but there's other things to do in Bolzano as well. Um, there's a beautiful city center. There's a great farmer's market. All the stores are in these like arched uh, sort of, they're not really tunnels, but porches covered, i don't know covered and, sidewalks yeah and they're and they're all passageways. sort of yeah passageways it's just a really cool place and i'm sure that's great because shopping street yeah it's you know in the winter it could be probably pretty snowy and, and the vineyards climb right up out of the out of the town on, along the mountainsides and the hillsides uh, so it's a huge wine growing region and they have one or i think they have two wine fests throughout the year a spring and then a fall so that's a good that time would be to plan a, good time a visit. To go. mm -hmm. Of course, it's going to be more crowded, but hey, you get to try all the wine. And of course, you can do wine tasting in the shops too. And they have skiing in the winter, hiking in the summer. 
because the alpine meadows and the wildflowers are just beautiful. Um, and you can take the, in the summertime, it's a great time just to take the cable cars up the mountains and hike around in the mountain areas. You can bring your mountain bike with you and ride down from the top. One of my favorite restaurants and hotels is on a mountain on the opposite side of the valley from Bolzano. And you take up this really old, like antique cable car. What do you call those things? Is it a cable Gondola. car? Gondola. Yeah. Uh, and you take it up to this inn, which is the reason they built it long ago, uh, was to get more people to come to the inn. And there's an incredible view of the valley and Bolzano down at the bottom of the mountain. And the food is, is amazing. Do you remember what the name of the restaurant was? The Kohler Inn. The Kohler Inn. Well, we ate great food there. One of the good things about this region too is, like I said, it's right on the Austrian border. So there are plenty of um, restaurants in the area that don't do just typical Italian, but have sort of an Italian, Austrian I don't want to use the word. Yeah, like Tyrolean food. Yeah. It's really delicious. Really hearty because you're up in the mountain air. Really, Dumplings, really yummy. Fried potatoes. Pizza. We pizza, had pizza in the pasta, town square. Because it's Italy. Yeah. It was it was all good. Everything about this town. Well, and and we did see other tourists there. Maybe we could count them on both hands. Like I would say ten or less. Yeah. And this was, it was a little off season, but it wasn't that but off But you're never going to get the crowds that you would at in the Cinque Terre anywhere or in Rome else. or in Venice or anywhere else. And it was, it was just wonderful. And we've been to Tuscany and we've been to um, Florence. We've been to Venice and we've been really, we, we've done the country. Sicily. Pretty, we've Sicily and Sardinia and we love them all. But this is my absolute yeah. number one favorite place to go. With that, we want to thank you for joining us at Streets and Eats and listening to our podcast. We have a lot of fun putting it together and we hope that you really enjoy it. We have the goal of having you savor the adventure. If you love doing this and you want to join in the conversation, join our private Facebook group at Streets and Eats and you can tell us all about the towns that you love in Italy and the food that you love to eat. It's a private group. You just need to answer a few questions and we'll get you in there as quickly as we can. Please remember, hit the subscribe button and tell all your friends. Ciao, Ciao for, for now. now.